name is Michael Rickards, and this is the whole Institute of Public Policy's forum. And I'm delighted to have with us today a person that's known to many people who read carefully our website, Dr. Sal Pizzurro. Sal, welcome. Thank you. Glad to Good have to be you here. here. Uh, we ran with Dr. Pizzurro, I should mention, a very successful conference a while ago on the problems of disabled people in New Jersey. And I get constant comments about what a wonderful conference it was. And of course, you played a, a major role with our own founder, uh, George Hall. People just loved it. And uh, they talked to us about having a, another one. If we can find a site, we probably will. If we can find a site in a, in a, a time frame for it. Time frame we when will. People are asking me as well when we will have a follow-up we, we conference. We will have a follow-up. We will have a follow-up. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you on to do to deal with two issues. They're not necessarily different, but the approach is a little different. One is the question of deinstitutionalization and institutionalization. And we had a, a previous person on here, um, Alison uh, Lozano, who f felt very strongly that we needed to put people into the community. And I asked questions in which I said that I I wasn't sure the community was ready for them, that we had this approach done in the 60s with Kennedy and dealing with mentally retarded, and we ended up just throwing in the community that wasn't ready for them. And she gave a very articulate defense. What's your view on that as a, a longtime advocate? Well, actually, Dr. Lozano and I had um, a couple of conversations about this very issue uh, since October. Um, I am uh, as passionate in hoping to transfer as many institutionalized people with developments of disabilities to the community as possible. Where we differ is on two issues. One is whether everyone is a candidate for community living. And secondly, we differ on the interpretation of the Olmstead Supreme Court decision. And where we differ is that um, in fact, many people in New Jersey, especially in our current state administration, our current governor's office, uh, have misinterpreted Olmstead because their interpretation is that Olmstead calls for the deinstitutionalization of every individual with a developmental disability and community placement. A couple of problems with that. One is the Supreme Court. Is Olmstead a Federal? Olmstead is a United States Supreme Court it's decision. U.S. Supreme Court, not state court. Okay. Yeah, United States Supreme Court decision. Um, and it was, um, the, the decision was rendered um, when um, two individuals, actually representing other people with developmental disabilities in Georgia, who were institutionalized, um, took legal action because they were denied their request to be placed in the community. Um, and the, originally the state court in Georgia uh, rendered a decision against them. Eventually went to the United States Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court uh, ruled that uh, people with developmental, developmental disabilities who are institutionalized can be transferred to the community based on several conditions. The first is that individual, that patient, must make the request. They must want to be transferred to the community. And two, there mu actually the second part is that there must be a professional team, doctors, social workers, psychologists, so forth, who would make the decision based on their analysis that these people are capable of surviving in the community. The third, the fir third part of their decision was there must be uh, an acceptable placement for them in the community and, they, and the state must demonstrate that they can provide the same services that were required in the larger institutions in a community setting. Those are the provisos. What I'd like to do, if I could take a 30 seconds, is to read a section, uh, a quote from the United States Supreme Court. And this quote, uh, which is actually was made at the time that the old Olmstead decision uh, was rendered, uh, was, was um, attributed to several members of the court, but it was actually, it actually originated with Associate Justice Stevens, who is now retired. But what he said at the time was, 
after the Olmstead decision was rendered. We emphasize that nothing in the Americans with Disabilities Act or its implementing regulations condones termination of institutional settings for persons unable to handle or benefit from community settings. Nor is there any federal requirement that community-based treatment be imposed on patients who do not desire it. What I have found is that many of the people who, in New Jersey, who misinterpret the Olmstead decision, including people in the governor's office, have read synopses of the Olmstead decision, but never read the actual language of the Supreme Court decision, the legal language. And there are many versions or interpretations and summaries of the Olmstead decision that does not include what I just read to you. Uh, and their, their interpretation is, we must deinstitutionalize everyone. There are several reasons why I am uh, suggesting that, uh, that we move with caution regarding the institutionalization in, in New Jersey. One is history. If uh, back when uh, Christine Todd Whitman was our governor, she decided she would close many of the psychiatric centers and in effect deinstitutionalizing the patients and placing them in the community. And she did. She did not close, she did not close all of the, the centers, but she closed several psychiatric centers, deinstitutionalized de over a thousand people, and within a year many of those people were homeless. Eventually they became more words of the state once again because they either went on welfare or became part of the criminal justice system. And it cost us more money as a state to care for them in that situation than it did when they were residing in the psychiatric institution. Now, as a disability, disability policy specialist and someone who has fought for the civil and human rights of people with disabilities my entire professional life, I am the first one to say, please, let's include everyone possible in the community, everyone with a disability, because I'm convinced that people with disabilities, not only in New Jersey but nationally, are denied their due process rights regularly, have always been denied their civil and human rights. They must become part of our community. They not, must not be segregated. However, there are some people who require round-the-clock care and the type of intensive care that cannot be provided in a community setting. Now, a, good, a great goal, a really noteworthy goal in New Jersey that I wish our governor would follow would be to create the community settings that would have all of the services that these people need. If we can do that first, then we can talk about, seriously talk about, deinstitutionalizing everyone now who's in the, those larger settings. It's my fear that the decisions are being made based on money rather than based on the needs of these people. I just, uh, now this is uh, the deinstitutionalization question, but you've also given us a, a great many articles recently about the whole abuse of the disabled, which I don't think most of us were aware of. Could you give us a general outline of what that's all about? Yes, I've been working with several state legislators actually since the conference that we both uh, are chaired in October. Who are you working with? Well, Senator, Gen uh, Senator Jennifer Beck, who, Beck, who yeah. testified at that conference, uh, Assemblyman Gary Shear, Senator Barbara Bono, uh, Assemblywoman Valerie Huddle, Assemblywoman Connie Wagner. Um, and um, just recently, in fact, as, as recently as last night, another member of the legislature, Assemblywoman, Assemblyman Tim Eustace from the 38th Legislative District in Bergen County, offered to help in the mission that we have. And then that mission is to provide protections for people with developmental disabilities who reside in uh, residential care in New Jersey. That would be, um, um, that would be foster care, the larger developmental centers, group homes, nursing homes, supervised apartments, and those who are in day training centers. Um, and why have we decided to move with this? Um, now, as you know, Dr. Rickards, I've been involved in fighting for the civil rights of this population uh, for a very long time, ever since, certainly since we've known each other. Um, I have found that, actually, I will tell you, uh, I've been in this field for 42 years. And I like to tell everyone that I was only a a kid when I started, but uh, you know I, I'm an old folk, and uh, I wasn't even born then. So yeah, I know, I know that. Uh, but I've been uh, involved in this for, for a long time, and I find that I still need to be educated regarding my field and regarding the needs of people with disabilities. And what I found for, in October at that conference from Senator Beck is that there's a population there 
out there in New Jersey that's suffering atrocious abuse in residential centers. Some of them died, and we actually did a study. We found that over the last five years, there have been 35,000 reported cases of abuse, neglect, and exploitation in those residential centers, and over 1,000 deaths. Is that across the nation? No, in New Jersey. 35,000? Over a five-year period, correct. In just New Jersey? In just New Jersey. So what we started to do, actually Jennifer Beck had come to my conference to talk about a law that she had sponsored called Tara's Law that would be a beginning in terms of providing protections. And Tara's Law was based on um, a constituent of hers in her legislative district by the name of Tara O'Leary, who was a 29-year-old woman who lost 70 pounds in a community care residence. Due, due, due to neglect, she was not fed, and she weighed 48 pounds when she died. Now, Senator Beck tried to provide protections for Tara Leary while she was still alive. She had to go to court to get this woman released from that community care residence. And she finally got the court order for this woman's release three days before she passed away. And she's a former DA. Yes. Imagine if you yes. didn't know the system. And when she talked about Tara's law, uh, it... Um, it spiked an emotional chord in many of the people who attended the conference, many of whom were parents of young adults with developmental disabilities who reside in these same residential centers. Now, Tara's law, the bill, was just passed by the uh, Senate Health Committee uh, last week. I was there, I testified at that hearing. It took four and a half years to get out of committee. Uh, now that it's at a committee, it still needs to go to the full Senate. The Assembly needs to do the same work, and hopefully it'll eventually get to the governor's desk for signature. It probably will be at least five years from start to finish. Now, what was decided at that uh, committee hearing, and actually decided a long time ago, is that those protections for now will be limited to those clients who reside in foster care. So that bill does not include those clients who reside in uh, the developmental centers, group homes, nursing homes, supervised apartments, or in day training centers. Now we tried, and when I say we, I testified at three hearings in the last two weeks for the state legislature, representing a group of parents, those parents on a pro bono basis, uh, trying to get the, the state legislature to include an amendment that would expand those protections to all residential centers and all people with developmental disabilities. And we were not successful. It was suggested to us that we start separate legislation. The very next day, Assemblyman Gary Shear from the 36th Legislative District asked me to write a draft for him on the legislation that we want, which I did within 24 hours. And now he's presenting it to uh, the Office of Legislative Services. And we're hoping to get the same support on the Senate side. Because, as I mentioned at the hearing, uh, if we wait another five years, we'll have an additional 35,000 cases at least uh, of abuse, and we'll have at least an, an additional 1,000 deaths, which is unacceptable. Well, what do these abuse cases involve? What do they do? Well, do to among the parents that I'm working with right now, there's one case where um, uh, a gentleman who, uh, a financial analyst from Upper Saddle River, New Jersey, whose son uh, choked on a wrapper in front of his supervisor uh, at the uh, the Bancroft Developmental Center, which is a private non nonprofit developmental center. Uh, another case was a client, the parent uh, of a young man who was beaten to death. Another case, someone I'm working very closely with, um, who resides in Wayne, her son was nearly beaten to death and wound up in intensive care, beaten to death, by the way, by staff. Mm. Um, I can go on and on. Uh, there's another parent who's working with us, both her son and her niece died in a group home. Um, and the numbers are much higher than the numbers of fat fatalities by either abuse, neglect, or some kind of violent action that you and I would face. We are safer as non-disabled people walking the streets in the most crime-ridden inner city than people are in group homes or nursing homes or daycare centers or developmental centers and foster care in New Jersey. Does that lend credence to the, the argument of some people that 
institutions are not protecting well, the, the disabled, well, get rid of them. No, and I will tell you why it's not. Because one of the community settings that the governor is considering that he would equate as to deinstitutionalization would be the same foster care settings that where the people are residing where there's no more than five clients in a private home run by um, perhaps a man or you know husband and wife with other children and a family style. The same level of fatalities are occurring there. And why? What we're finding is, because the first question we ask is why is this happening, yeah. is that first of all, uh, among the direct care staff, uh, criminal background checks are, if I can use, be very candid, are a joke. They're almost non-existent. They're usually minimum wage jobs, and usually the people are hard, we're finding, are people who can't get a job anywhere else. And the nonprofit organizations, which in my opinion are really profit making, are hiring these people because they have to pay them less. So they're getting people who are desperate for any kind of job. And usually those people, as we're finding, there's several studies that support this, are angry individuals. They're angry because of the set setting they're in. They're angry because it is very hard work. They're angry because of the low rate of pay. And eventually that emotion is taken out on the people they're supposed to care for. Uh, it's a very trying issue. And I would just tell you, uh, as you know, I work on a lot of projects dealing with the developmentally disabled, and since these parents have approached me, I've dropped every other project I've been working on, and I'm only representing these people pro bono. I'm not even doing my professional paid work since these people have approached me. So for the last five months, this is all I've been doing. Why? Because I just found out that I can't say no to a situation like this that is so critical. Because I thought about it. Um, what I would have to trade off in my personal and professional life to do this. I could not say no to these parents. And there are members of the state legislature that I mentioned to you that feel the same way, luckily. But there are a few of them. There are, like, I would say, not much more than a handful out of 120 members of the state legislature. There are not much more than a handful who are, who are as committed to this issue. And I see this as a high priority issue that we need to resolve immediately. Why are they not committed to it? Don't they have I, well, friends, I think, relatives, acquaintances? Well, what we found out is uh, the only ones who tend to show any sympathy uh, and, and any support are those who have an immediate family member who has a severe disability. But even some of those are not because somehow they're not getting the message. Uh, where we were able to reach people in the last few weeks, uh, one of the parents I'm working with, actually created a collage. I would love for you to meet with her at some point. A collage with the photographs of the, the victims, the sons and daughters of the parents that I'm working with. And was able to point out to legislatures, this is my son and this is what happened. This is Joe who's sitting here and his daughter died. She was beaten to death. This is so-and-so who died who was starved to death and went on. She has a collage of about 30 clients. Pictures of them with scars, black and blue, uh, in, in, in the hospital intensive care on life support just before they, they passed on. It, they're horrific. I mean, what I prefer to, to term I hate to use is, and it's offensive to some people, but I am using it, is we are actually committing a limited form of selective genocide with this population. Uh, and I don't mean this to insult anyone, any group that's yeah, as you, you probably know, I'm, I've engaged in Holocaust research and I'm a strong supporter of those uh, uh, who uh, have suffered uh, during the greater Holocaust, uh, some of whom I, I continue to work with. Uh, but this is I, what I call a selective Holocaust, selective genocide in New Jersey, and we're doing nothing about it. We're allowing it to happen. I should mention, which is off the subject, that you gave us once a series of pictures taken by your uncle of one of the Nazi death camps. Yeah. We put those pictures up on the whole, yes. on the whole website which I think is an important historical contribution, just as the Holocaust was being denied by the Prime Minister in, in Iran. Right. Was fast. What, what death camp was that? Was that, that was a Buchenwald. Buchenwald. And the reason why I, I share them with you, my uncle was one of the first members of the Western armies, both the British and the Americans, to uh, encounter the Holocaust. Other camps had been uh, liberated in the East by the Russians. Right. And at that point, there was such poor communication between the Soviet Union and the Western governments that they did not share that information until after the war. Although there was a first page, page article in the New York Times in 1943 that exposed it, nobody paid attention until the American army walked into Buchenwald. And 
my uncle, uh, Sergeant Tony Pizzurro, who passed on, took pictures immediately. He said, we have to photograph this because nobody's going to believe it. And he had been in the D-Day invasion. He had been in uh, the Battle of the Bulge. He saw all kinds of atrocities marching across Europe. And when he got to Weimar, Germany, that's where Buchenwald was, and he saw this, he said, this is nothing like anything I experienced. And just before he passed on, he shared those photographs with me with, with the condition that I would never profit with them, by them, but try to use them to educate people that took place. Because my uncle, after the war, was offered uh, money by all kinds of news sources to publish it, and he refused to accept a penny. And it was his goal. This is a man who suffered the Great Depression and little didn't eat free, did not know what three meals a day were like until uh, he was engaged in uh, FDR's CC, CCC camps in the 1930s. Um, faced all kinds of hardship. When he walked into Buchenwald, he said, this is nothing like anything I experienced growing up poor in the Great Depression or fighting and seeing my friends die uh, in battle. Well, and he was committed from that point on to are, educate people. They are important historical documents. I hope that you'll look at them. I think they also probably belong in the Holocaust Museum. They are in Yad Vashem in Israel. In, in, in Israel. Yes, yes. And, and in, I was thinking of the one in Washington, which mm -hmm. some of us have had the chance to visit. And this has been a fascinating conversation as well from a dedicated advocate. Dr. Sal, thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you, to as you always. Again. Okay. And I hope that all of you will join us for another session that we're having of the Hall Institute's Public Policy Forum. Thank you and goodbye.